Thank you, Abigail, for putting this together. And we've got plenty of donuts and Pop-Tart bites and other things to grab um, afterwards. So I am going to introduce our guests this evening. We have Dan Beller, who graduated in 2012. He is the Chief Operating Officer of Econize Closets and Blinds. <laughs> he has been employed there since before graduation. Econize serves clients in Nova, DC, and parts of Maryland. Dan manages all aspects of operations, including scheduling, sales, inventory, custom material orders, HR, and accounting. That is a lot. It is. It's a lot of hats. Um, so, then we have Jackson Kulik, who graduated in 2009. He is the joint CEO of Blue Ridge Graphics. He prints most all of our t-shirts that we get here, correct? Ooh, yes. Uh, yeah. So, you are probably, somebody, somebody's wearing a shirt that he has helped make. Um, this is a brutally hard job. He works with his brother, which is likewise hard, uh, managing the 25 plus person company. He works as a consultant for a solar company and has helped to start two nonprofits. He has a wife and four boys, which is also equally hard. Um, Jackson will discuss some of the many hard things about managing companies as well. So, who's coming first, Jackson? Yeah. So welcome Jackson to the stage, thanks. Thank you. So my intention, um, the goal that I had uh, in regards to what, kind of what I, want, what I want to talk about tonight is to give you a little bit of an idea what a day-to-day -day, you know, running a business looks like, yeah, that experience, um, and then also to talk about some of the things that I have found really challenging. I was surprised about some of these challenges that I'll talk to you about tonight um, that I found in a secular workplace, and I, and I underlined secular because I know that that's not applicable I mean, you're, you're, you're probably, your environment's pretty Catholic, right? 98% Catholic. 98% Catholic. <laughs> um, so my goal is to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like on the secular end, what you can experience, um, what you can anticipate, and then hopefully provide a little bit of insight as far as kind of what skills you would use, um, you can further develop from your time here in order to uh, succeed in that, in that environment. My first note was that you can tell I mean business when you bring a clipboard. So I did underline that as well. Um, I'm not particularly into the formality. Uh, you know, I do a lot of talking for our company. I'm not uh, nervous about it, I'm not shy about it, but I do think one of the reasons that this is special is because I feel that um, I am really interested, my brother was really interested in helping me work on this, my sister was very interested in helping me work on this, because as a family we felt like it was a really important thing for us to kind of provide a little bit of context, kind of color your expectations as far as what you can anticipate in the workforce. That being said, there's a little bit of a caveat in that 24 hours ago, 48 hours ago, I, I wouldn't have been able to do this. We've had, my family's had the flu for the past week, so mentally we're super fried, um, and I'm going to be working almost exclusively off of my notes, so forgive me for that. I'm going to try to be coherent. Um, so as far as the intro, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here. So pre-Christendom, I was born in Madison County, Virginia. That's about an hour and a half from here. Very country, more cows than people, standard country. Uh, mix of homeschool and public school in the early years did about half and half. Homeschool, half, half, half public school. Um, I was raised in a very Catholic, very strong family. Four kids, so I have three siblings. Um, it was a really tight family. It was not, we had no Catholic friends. Um, went to public school, went to public high school. I really disliked public high school, um, but it was a very conservative, you know, decent school for a public high school. Um, but, you know, again, it was the exposure that I had to living a Catholic life and to kind of having those friendships with Catholics um, was essentially zero before coming to Christendom. Um, I was really close with my older sister, who was a senior when I was a freshman. And that was a primary reason for me attending Christendom. Um, I was very lazy in regards to the formal schooling. Public high school did not challenge me mentally very much. And um, I didn't really, I didn't know what I wanted out of college. I wasn't really planning, I didn't have a goal. I wanted a career in music. I was very disciplined with music. I would write and work on that, you know, hours every day. Um, but the secondary education was not a high priority. But I had seen my sister kind of develop and change after she went to Christendom. She became even 
she became cooler than what she um, had been in high school, which was, which was big, because like I said, we, we were very close. And she seemed really happy. Even when she was getting into trouble, it was still different than high school, because she would be in trouble in high school and not be happy, or she would come home and be a little bit in trouble, but be really happy at Christendom. So that was, um, you know, I guess you could say it's more of an innocent uh, being in trouble when you're in trouble at Christendom. Um, and so that was really appealing. It was kind of exciting, the idea of you know, um, being involved in playing soccer and stuff like that. But my, my path was definitely chosen by my guardian angel, you know, the Holy Spirit. I, di I didn't do it deliberately. Um, at Christendom, I, had a, I did have a wonderful time. I was planning on transferring after the first year, um, but I ended up having a blast. Stayed, you know, all four years. Uh, like I said, I played, played in the soccer team for a couple years. That was great. Went to Rome, studied in Ireland at Cork University, not with Christendom, and that was fantastic. And my highlight that I would say, you know, my number one thing that I think um, that I look back and I'm really appreciative of was the, the people and the relationships that I had with my fellow students and, and professors and staff. Um, the, you know, the energy and the excitement, the adventure, um, enjoying getting to know all different types of people, that was something that I found really appealing and not particularly hard. I mean, the cliques here at Christendom, if you even could use the word cliques, um, should certainly be worked through by everybody because they are nothing compared to real cliques. <laughs> You, know, you go out into the professional world and you'll experience some real, you know, negative, bad clicks. So, you know, Christendom is a, a pretty easy place to get to know pretty much everybody on, on either end of the spectrum. A good example would be uh, one of my best friends from Christendom was very straight-laced RA, ended up being the head RA, and we didn't know each other at all until Rome, which, you know, you get, you get put in these tight groups and it's very concentrated, and we ended up becoming... Um, great friends, and the reason is because you understand each other's priorities, right? Getting to heaven, the mass, that's why we became such good friends, because we knew one another through the Eucharist already. And that is definitely what I would say is you know, the most important thing that I learned at Christendom that I apply um, in the business world is, first and foremost, the mass being the most important event in my life. That's always, um, you know, when you, when you have that, when you're able to attend mass on a Ideally, you know, more than on Sunday, so on Saturdays during the week a little bit, that is an incredible boost for a professional life and for keeping you sane. Um, a couple other things that I really took away were key friendships with a few saints. So if you don't have those, I would start working on that. I had three, St. Padre Pio, St. Therese, St. Gemma. Those are probably the three that kind of have maintained a um, place in my life where they've been active and helped me through my struggles, which I'll talk to you. The emotional intelligence is, I said I kind of developed that out of theology, you know, I developed that out of um, studying theology. So I was a theology major. I'm going to go quickly from post-college and then get to uh, the day-to-day -day management. Post-college, got married, started a family. We have a bunch of boys. We have four boys. Um, worked for the state for a year. Started a nonprofit. Um, it was called Small Hands, Large Hearts. It was working with local schools that, uh, for the students to build pieces of artwork, and then we deliver those pieces of artwork to uh, nursing homes in the same community so that you had an interaction of the youth and the elderly, which is greatly lacking. Um, and everybody in the nursing home community thought it was fantastic, and they loved it, and it was really significant. And it is defunct, so we let it end because... Um, also go back to that in a little bit, you know, failure is a really, really big part about being in the business world. Um, the majority of the stuff that I've done is, has failed, for sure. So that is, you know, get back to that. So then, after I worked, in the, after I worked for the state for a year, I started working for the family screen printing business, uh, Blue Ridge Graphics. We print t-shirts. We do other stuff, but printing t-shirts is basically it. Um, 25 employees. I spent the first three years in marketing. Um, a lot of online stuff, a lot of online advertisement. And I did a little side marketing, uh, worked with a, another Christendom friend. We built a website. It was hacked by ISIS. <laughs> true. That's a true story. It's very pathetic. Like on everybody's, very pathetic of the ISIS person. It was just lazy. But 
that, that definitely ended the moonlighting there for the marketing for me. And then after three years, we moved into a management role. So I've been doing that for about five years with my brother. Um, and I do manage the company with my brother, which is, which is a bad idea. You, you don't want to manage, you don't want to have two bosses who are one company. But, but at least we're both aware of that and we work through that together. Um, I have done some solar consulting for a friend. It was successful. His company is very successful. Um, it was specifically in regards to kind of company growth and strategy, uh, a lot of hiring consulting. So I would just kind of put that as general consulting. It wasn't, you know, we got some cool work out of it. We got some really big, big solar projects out of it. Um, but it was a similar to the to the first nonprofit. You know, it it was great and it was a great experience for me. But you know. Even that, you, the, the biggest lessons I learned were certainly lessons of failure, that by the end of it, you know, I was looking at this um, consulting gig. It, was, uh, it, was, it felt really significant to me. It was really exciting. And then you, know, you have to deal with it when things change and it ends up not panning out and being as big and beautiful and amazing as, as amazing as it could be. So you know, pretty much everything that I'm going to go through, um, and I'll have to speed it up, has that element of you're always balancing kind of your failure with your um, with your kind of energy and courage to be able to pick up the pieces and move on and not be too um, well not be too, too disappointed so the last yeah and then and then you know there is another nonprofit that my sister and I are starting that um, our mother has essentially been doing all the work for the past 25 years this emergency fund emergency services for rural communities um, but I'm going to gloss over that for right now and move to the daily life of management. So we are both general managers. We're both CEOs. He has a more inward-facing look, so he takes care of operations. He takes care of procedures. He takes care of production. I have more of an outward-facing look. I take care of the sales, uh, the management. We split the HR duties, which are very significant. Um, we split a lot of like the financial planning, uh, we split a lot of the business strategy. But, um, so about my average week at least 25% of the time is spent in meetings. Uh, I have one-on-ones with my sales team, there's four of them. We have a sales department meeting, we have a marketing meeting uh, with another, uh, with Jeremy Minnick, so he, I know he's ta talked here before. We have a purchasing meeting, we have a financial, like an admin meeting, we have a manager meeting, we have an operations meeting, um, my brother and I try to do two or three kind of planning meetings um, that take about an hour each. And yeah, and then you're always preparing for something like an all hands meeting, right? Because you're trying to keep, not only do you have to meet with every department, you have to be communicative, you have to relay expectations to those people, you have to be listening to those people. Those things are huge. Um, you also have to you know, be thinking about the bigger picture. Uh, moving your company along, the vision, the mission, keeping it, keeping everybody, you know, uh, knowing what you're trying to accomplish as a as a unit instead of as a department. So meetings, I mean, those are, and then that's one meeting for each department. So it's a lot of meetings for me. But you'd think, well, how much, you know, how many meetings is appropriate for each department? If you have five people in a department, it seems very appropriate that they would have at least one meeting a week that is within that department. So that's kind of where you get into these sticky situations. You have enough people, you don't have enough management, you end up spending a third of your time, or you, know, you have 12 meetings once a week. But again, the, uh, you can't really avoid that because it very quickly comes down to the dignity of the people you're working with. Um, if you asked, we went to a leadership training uh, the other day, me and my management team, and the biggest uh, complaint that all the other companies had was that their bosses don't communicate well. They don't listen well. They don't relay expectations. So it's really basic tenets of you know, human dignity. They don't share information for me, and I feel offended. They don't listen to me as an individual. They don't think that my ideas are worthwhile and can contribute. So it's almost um, even looking at you know, like the red tape, the boring side of management, it really, really, really quickly distills down to, in order to take care of human beings, you have to be really, really uh, specific. You have to be very deliberate in how you're treating everybody. 
I would say another quarter of my time is individual sales, um, individual sales tasks. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on like the, on the perks of running a business. I, I think that you're probably pretty familiar with the perks of running a business. Uh, you do get a certain amount of freedom of your schedule, and that's obviously, uh, you know, it's unrivaled to have that freedom. You don't have a boss, which is great. I have a brother, which is kind of like similar to having a boss. But you no know, boss is amazing. Um, you get to do a lot of stuff that you want to do. You can kind of get to choose the projects you're working on. Um, so we've chose we chose to do a you know massive remodel of our business and in increase the production floor. Uh, we're we'll probably buy a business this year because it's you know because it's our uncle's business and we might as well. Not much else is going on. Past five years, we we we've been able to grow the business fifty percent in the past five years. Uh, we get to travel occasionally. It's not that glam, glam glamorous like what we actually get to do, but saying you get to travel is sounds a lot better. There's a lot, yeah, sounds good. it sounds good. There's a lot of power, which is a joke and not a joke. It's it's attractive. It feels it feels really good to have power. Um, it's, yeah, obviously that's a really thing you have to be really careful with. Um, um, and then you get to achieve some really significant results. So we had, uh, we were the primary printer for UVA basketball when they won the national championship. And you know, as soon as the games ended, we watched the we watched the whole tournament last year. Does anybody know that UVA won last year basketball? Yeah, you're supposed to, you're supposed to know. It's supposed to be a joke. Uh, it was really big for us. So the whole company you were watching every game um, as a as a group because at the significant points in the tournament, for those people that don't know basketball, the basketball tournament, the Sweet Sixteen, the Elite Eight, the Final Four, those key games, we had the entire company you know staffed. As soon as the game ends, as soon as UVA wins, we had to be prepared. Tens of thousands of T-shirts. You know, you, you run downstairs and you fire up the the presses and you start printing T-shirts and you're printing T-shirts all night long, and it was really exciting. And we were we were terrified as a company, but the action steps, the biggest things that I would recommend, um, and that has helped me in every kind of difficult situation, by far the biggest thing has been the importance of mental prayer. So memorize prayers; they're great. But they don't provide, they will not provide you, maybe there is one, but they will not provide you the same comfort as mental, as mental prayers, um, as conversational prayers with, uh, with Jesus, the Trinity. Because you were made in the image of God, and specifically you. So you're a reflection, and a unique reflection of the Trinity. So the words that you'll say in a conversational and a mental prayer are unique. You know, and God wants to hear those specific words. They hold a special place in his heart. Mental prayer was the only reason. Going home at night, being able to decompress, um, spend time, you know, meditating, just being in the presence of God, that was the only way that I've been able to get through, um, you know, any of the really challenging situations, much less the, the moderately challenging situations. Um, the second thing I would say would be to find a mentor. Um, I've had a lot of good mentors, no, no great mentors, but mentors are huge as far as providing a little bit of the emotional support, providing a little bit of that, that, that experience. Um, the third thing is kind of a, a reiteration of the first one, which is create and execute on a daily prayer routine. Um, like I was saying, you know, if you are interested in management, if you're interested, this, is, this is action steps for any profession, specifically in the secular world. Um, if, if you're going to go that route, you, cannot, you, know, you can't afford to not have something down like a daily prayer routine. It's going to change when you're not in the Christian world, um, and if that's not a goal, you know it's not going to happen without a lot of deliberation, a lot of effort. Um, the last two points I had would be develop a devotion to your guardian angel naturally, and I guess these seem kind of fluffy, but these are literally what I would redo from the beginning if I was going to start over. I would have had these things as the, the forefront. I would not have thought about more education, you know, I would not have thought about interning. Um, those are good things, but 
not at all compared to what um, taking care of your, your brain, your, your soul is in relation. And then the last thing I have would be to find, uh, consider a piste if you're going to be in the working world. Um, but if a piste is not an option, then I would definitely consider any spiritual group, uh, Benedictines, anybody. Anybody, Father Vazano told me that you just have to join anybody that's around. Doesn't do any good if you want to be a Benedictine and there aren't Benedictines for 300 miles. You know, that's would be very prideful to say, I'm not going to do anything. So that would be my last uh, kind of advice. And I, and I, and I know that, again, I, I, you know, I fear that my um, consistency was not where it needed to be. Oh, I will blame the flu. I will blame that. But um, I'd be happy to share these with you um, in any capacity. And I'd be happy to exchange emails um, as well as far as if you're interested in um, getting some advice about professions, uh, hearing more, that kind of thing. So with that, I'm going to conclude. Um, so I think uh, the initial point I wanted to make, everybody, is that, in my opinion, um, business management is a lot like a gin and tonic. It's not complicated, but if you screw it up, it's terrible. <laughs> but if you do it right, it works really well and it's really good. So that's my initial point. Um, my path leading up to Christendom, um, I was homeschooled for my entire career um, through grade school and high school. And then um, both of my older sisters had come to Christendom. And my senior year of high school, my, this, my sister right above me was a senior at Christendom. Um, so we wouldn't have been here together, but I was just like, Kristen, I'm not, that's where my older sister's from. Why would I go there? I'm not, I'm not doing that. So um, right up to her graduation in May of uh, 2008, and um, at her, that graduation weekend, I came for, you know, the baccalaureate mass was here, was on campus, and I was like, all right, Lord, I get it. And I just really, I really experienced... Um, I, I feel like I knew I had been resisting the call to come to Christendom before that point, um, but that weekend it really kind of hit me, and I was like, okay, all right, fine, here we go. So, um, not really that reluctantly, but I, I came to Christendom, and boy, thank God, I'm glad I did, because the only reason I'm standing here in front of you with, as you know, somebody who pretends to be qualified to talk about business management is because I came here, I found my career here, I met my wife here, so I'm very grateful that... Um, I came to Christendom and did everything I did here and met all the people I did. Um, so, um, yeah, like I said, I, I found my job because of Christendom. Um, Professor Sharon Hickson, her son-in-law, Paul, is uh, the head of installations for my company, Econize Closets. Um, and she was at a bridal shower senior year with my wife, Liz. We weren't married at the time. And, um, she was like, oh, Liz, what's Dan going to do for, you know, what's Dan doing for work? Because I wasn't, I had finished up a semester early here at Christendom. And um, she was like, oh, he's, you know, teaching martial arts. And that was about it. I wasn't doing much else. And uh, she was like, oh, Paul's company needs somebody. So I went and I interviewed with Paul. I interviewed with his business partner, Noel, my boss, uh, the owner of, com of the company. And um, the rest was history. So I started working for Econize a couple of months before my graduation in 2012. Um, I was a history major, and um, yeah, I've been there ever since. Um, so I guess to start out, a, a couple of things um, I feel like were a big help in my, in my Christendom career, things that um, sort of set me on my path or helped me um, in forming you know, the person I became through my Christendom education. Um, were, you know, obviously the classes, interactions with professors, um, really cultivating the spiritual life, like Jackson said. I mean, you can't act, emphasize that enough. An active prayer life um, now while you're here, guys, is, is just so important because at no other time in your life are you going to be surrounded by the sacraments, you know, the opportunity for daily adoration, daily mass, confession, all that stuff. It's, it's really important for forming, um, forming yourself as a person. Um, then, um, you know, as far as kind of starting to develop your, um, 
uh, your business sense and, and thinking about your career and all this stuff. Um, this one story I had uh, sophomore year, I believe it was, I was going to office hours with uh, Professor Burznak. I don't know if any of you have had him for poli sci. But I was going to talk to him about a paper or something. It was, it was pouring rain. And so I go running across, you know, into the, it was, I don't know where his office is now, but he was just in, in the quad there in Madonna at the time, soaking wet. And I've got like my paper stuffed into my jacket, you know, under my jacket. And I'm trying to, you know, so I get in there and I'm like, hey, you know, Professor Burznak, talking to him about my paper. And he's like, he just stops. He's like, get an umbrella. <laughs> it's like, oh, like, I haven't really thought about that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Like, just, but that, prof like, thinking about professionalism. Like, are you going to roll into, you know, your meeting with a client soaking wet because you forgot to bring an umbrella, and, you know, and it started raining that day? So, a small anecdote, but it had an impact on me. Um, another thing that um, really helped me, um, just kind of thinking about um, uh, personal responsibility, <laughs> paying bills, those are important, um, was that the summer before my senior year, I made the decision to get a job um, locally here up in Winchester, actually working at a uh, just a warehouse, driving a forklift, um, lived with some friends for the summer, and kept that job through my senior year. So having an off-campus job, you know, making a little bit of additional income, um, having to start, oh, you know, budgeting, that's something really important that I would strongly advise all of you to do. I don't, I know that, uh, you know, you're spending more money at the moment going to college than you're making, but um, being on a, uh, a personal budget and just having a job for your money and knowing where it's going, not just spending, I tell you, if I could get some of my, uh, my beer money back from Chris and I'm in, I'd probably be the owner of the company now, right? Not just the COO, but uh, <laughs> I probably wasn't supposed to say that. But. Um, anyway. So as students, you know, there are things you can do while you're here at Christendom um, to start preparing yourself for your career after college. I know it, it seems like a long way away, um, but it's not. Believe me, I don't, I don't feel like I'm 30. I don't, I don't know where the last 10 years have gone. Um, but it's really going to be here faster than you realize. Um, work, you know, professional life, your career, it's a lot like regular life. There's just money involved. So... All you have to do is realize that um, whether it's the spiritual life, whether it's your career, whether it's your personal life, relationships with your family, I mean, all this stuff, very similar principles apply to all of this. Um, the biggest principle is hard work. You just need to work at it. Um, so things you can do you know, now, treat your current vocation like your career. You know, Think about how the choices you're making now are affecting what you're going to do after college because again like I said it's it's not far away um, take advantage of office hours you know talk to your professors um, you know, not just about class talk you know just sit and have a conversation with them um, talk to staff at lunch you know they're people too so um, <laughs> no I, I actually I remember sort of like having this impression during college is like oh these these people aren't interested in talking to me like I'm, I'm just a college student like they're they don't want to talk to me. Believe me, that's not true. You know, all these people that work, you know, professors, staff, anybody at Christendom, like, they're here uh, because they believe in what um, the mission of this college is. So they're very much interested in all of you, even if you don't think they are. So you can learn from all of those people. Um, you know, just take ownership of your actions at this moment because um, it's going to pay dividends for you later. Um, so... Just going another step further here, just kind of talking about um, the way your education can apply to what you might do in your career, you know, if it was to be uh, business management. So, okay, so how many of you are here because you were interested in the topic tonight? And how many of you are here because you have to come to this thing? Be honest, it's okay. All right, All right get out, get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it's, uh, are the specific classes that you're taking you know, going to necessarily affect what you're doing in your career. Uh, you know, sure, if you're going into academia or, you know, you're going to be a teacher or specialized research, great, you have more power to you. But um, as a history major, has the fact that I know that the Battle of Hastings was in 1066 ever specifically helped me win a business deal? Uh, no, it hasn't. <laughs> but the things that have helped me are you want to remember to not – and I think this kind of holds true as a principle in, in all aspects of life, is don't look at things narrowly. You know, don't just look at a very 
um, specialized, narrow focus on, oh, well, is this specific class going to help me? You know, is that going to help me with my career? No, but broadly, your education is helping you with your career. So, I mean, because of my Christendom education, which, you know, at times wasn't super hard work, but at other times was, you know, different classes, different professors, all that stuff, different semesters, just depending on um, what you're doing. Um, you know, you learn how to work hard at something, how to be focused, how to dedicate yourself to it. You learn to take in a broad array of information and synthesize it and, you know, produce the results that you want. You can think critically about a business proposal. Um, you can react quickly to a situation to come up with a solution, whether it's, you know, personnel or um, a new opportunity, you know, for your business, things like that. Um, I would say one point for sure to remember is any plan that's enacted quickly and decisively is better than no plan at all. So just thinking um, proactively is very, very important in, in business management. Um, and so sorry, I, I'm, a little, uh, I'm a little out of order because my printer at home stopped working before I came over here, so I'm going off my old notes. But one of the things I had wanted to say um, at the beginning starting off was that when I, if you feel like I'm calling out bad habits you have, don't worry, it's not specifically you, and it's not specifically Christendom students. Um, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm observing and, you know, still trying to correct in myself negative habits or bad habits that I've seen, you know, in myself over the last 10 to 12 years. So <coughs> that's where that's coming from. Don't worry, it's not personal. So. Um, a couple of things, though, that, that you can do, I think, that are really important. And, and again, you can do this now in your studies. You know, you can do this in a spiritual life. You can do this in your relationships with friends. You can do this in work. You can do this in your, you know your physical fitness plan, working out, whatever it is. Um, systematize, you know, figure out a system because it's easier to stick to a system, right? Then uh, you're just all over the place. I'm gonna do it this way today, I'm doing it this way tomorrow. You know, something, a big focus of what I've done um, the last, uh, for about eight years now is um, custom material orders. So my company, um, sorry, I should have given a little more background at the beginning, Econize Closets and Blinds. Uh, we design and install uh, custom cabinetry anywhere in the house really except for like kitchens so it's mostly closets hence the name um, but we also do uh, laundry rooms home offices Murphy beds garage cabinetry all, all kinds of cool stuff um, we've also added on the last couple of years we now do a full range of um, blinds and window treatments but a big part of what I do is these custom material orders and so Every single part and piece is, you know, specifically set for exactly the right part of the design. And there are umpteen different details to each piece that I could screw up. So I've got a, I've got a computer. I've got a design software. It does a lot of the work for me. But there's still plenty of stuff you can mess up. So having a system is really important to make sure that you're going through, you're checking detail, and you're getting it right. So systematizing. Do, you know, do your tasks the same way so that you establish habits and they become second nature and they just happen and it will minimize mistakes. Um, prioritize. Don't just do the easy thing first because it's going to take you five minutes and then you can, you know, take a break and, you know, waste time. Look at your, look at your task list, prioritize, and do the hard thing first. You know, jump in and attack the unpleasant job because that's going to make you feel way better about everything else that you have to do. Start with the hardest task and you work your way to the easiest. Way better than starting with the easiest and working with the hardest. Um, delegate. You know, you're not going to be able to do everything yourself. So that's, especially if you're in a company, you know, you're in a small company, like Jackson said, you know, he's uh, 25 employees. I've, we've got about 15, 16 employees in our company. Um, delegating is really important. You're not going to be able to do everything yourself. So figure out the stuff that you have to do yourself. Again, you know, prioritize, figure out the important stuff, and then delegate off the things that you know can be done by someone else, you know, to someone else. Any good manager is, by necessity, a good delegator. Um, uh, lastly, then, execute. So stop procrastinating, quit making excuses, and just get it done. Um, but getting back to the, um, getting back to the question of your, your education coming into your, um, coming into your career, you know, again, like I said, you need to um, avoid getting too narrow and focused in your, in your analysis of what 
you're doing and how those things that you're doing and studying can apply to what you're going to do later in life, which again, you know, for some of you is a year away. For some of you, it's two, three, four. It's not that long, guys. Um, you don't need to be scared. Though. You know, it's exciting. Tips for achieving success. Um, I was laughing when <laughs> Jackson was saying that 25% of his time is spent in meetings because I hate meetings. I loathe meetings. Meetings are the worst. They take up so much time. So that was one of my notes was don't get bogged down in meetings. <laughs> if you can avoid it. Like I said, I've got, um, I've got a smaller company. Um, you know, I don't have as many people working directly under me. I have uh, four salespeople that are out on the road. I have three installation crews of seven to nine guys who are going out installing. And, you know, we've got a really good system in place, so everybody kind of knows what they need to do. They go out, they get it done, and we get back together. At the end of the day, review the installs, you know, review the sales appointments, all those kinds of things. Um, but keeping, you know, keeping meetings short, I would say that's the biggest thing. Yeah, people love to have their meetings run on long, and, um, you know, figuring out how you can get that meeting done by wasting as little of everyone's time as possible so that then they can go back and do their jobs is really important. Um, for sure, people are your best resource in your, you know, in your company, in your business. You want to find someone to do the job that will energize them. So for me, um, you know, I really enjoy those orders. I really enjoy checking all these designs over, making sure that each part and piece is correct, and then you know, putting the order in. For some people, that they might not enjoy that. So you want to make sure that when you're doing that delegation, like I was talking about, that you put the right people in the right role. Avoid getting them too specialized because you don't want to have someone, you know, working a particular function or task in your company that then they're out sick or they, you know, don't show up to work for the day or they go on vacation and everything collapses because that linchpin person is gone. It's, that means you haven't delegated properly, you haven't um, managed properly. So you want to make sure that everybody in, you know, under you and in your department understands to a certain extent each other's jobs. You know, somebody's out sick, great, no problem, we can fill the gap. Um, I would also highly recommend something to do on a weekly basis, you know, if you were to go, if, if you go into management, which I encourage you to do, it's great. I mean, you don't need to um, start out as, you know, the barista at Starbucks and then work your way up to be the manager at Starbucks. Not that Starbucks is where Chris and the people are that well, but, um, you know, or just, or at any retail store, you know, any, any kind of um, uh, business you might get into, like, believe me, they'll hire a manager, you know, that you don't need to work your way up through the ranks of, you know, any retail business out there. There are plenty of places that will hire you and train, you know, they see, you know, you, you put in a good interview, you've got a liberal arts education, and you um, uh, can get on a job training. You know, they'll hire a manager and they'll put you through a couple of weeks of training and boom, you're in, you're managing a store. So, um, something that I always try to do on a weekly basis is to look uh, look at the big picture. So take a couple of hours, try to devote a couple of hours that's not tied down to a specific task. Let yourself, you know, think big, think about how you can improve, think about how your employees can um, improve their systems and uh, you really find it. That time, for me anyway, is a, um, a time I get a lot of good thinking done and realize, oh, hey, actually, like, I'm doing something really inefficiently, or, or this person over here could improve the way that they're working through whatever task that they have. Um, another big thing that I think a lot of people in, um, not just in business, but in today's society in general, are terrible at is communication. So communication, um, my note here says communication covers a multitude of sins. So I mean, you can mess somebody's project up pretty badly <laughs> But if you communicate about with them and say, hey, no, I, re I know, we messed up your order, I'm really sorry, here's what we're gonna do to fix it. Oh, well, okay, thank you. No, I'm still not happy that you messed it up, but I appreciate that you're taking the time to rectify the situation. In the contracting world, you know, home improvement, um, remodeling, things like that, especially, people are notorious for horrible communication. So a lot of our clients find it really refreshing that we as a company have this policy of uh, 24 hours, 24 hours in the business week to respond to a call, an email, whatever it might be. I think that's a really important um, thing that you can have in, in any aspect of your life. Again, somebody calls you with a question that you don't know the answer to, 
nobody's expecting you to have the answers 100 percent of the time you say hey i don't know the answer to that but i'm going to call so and so over here who does have the answer my manufacturer or my <laughs> boss whatever it is and i'll get you an answer and i'll get back to you um so that's that's really really important i think again communication so we just like I said, um, an email comes in, a call comes in. You know, if it comes in on a Friday, I like trying to get it done before the weekend so that you don't have that hanging over you for the weekend, but 24 business hours. So we'll be back to that person by the same time the next business day with an answer to their question. Um, so then the, the follow-on to that, obviously a huge part of management is uh, not just managing your people, but also um, managing the service to your customers. So customer service, and that's just is really important, you know, phrase that everybody throws around. Anybody have any, what does customer service mean to all of you? Somebody shout it out. Anybody? Oh, we got really good customer service here. <laughs> Nobody? Okay, that's fine. You guys are shy. Sorry. So, discuss. Good question. Let's talk about that after. Let me, let me get through a couple of points and then I'll answer what I think about that. Um, what does excellent customer service mean? Does it mean getting it right 100% of the time? No, you know, we're human. We're not gonna get it right 100% of the time. Is it having the cheapest product? No, it's not that either because you wanna be building value for your customer. You don't wanna just be the cheapest guy on the block. You want your client to appreciate that what the service or the product that you're giving them has value. Um, it's not having the fastest lead time. That might be a nice feature to have, but it doesn't have to be the case. Um, I think what it is, is it's being upfront and honest with your customers. It's telling them what you can do and what you can't do. It's being clear, it's being concise, it's sticking to what you've told them. Um, it's being realistic. You know, Don't overpromise and then under deliver. If anything, you wanna do the opposite. Um, and like I said, but you know, back here, it's it's taking full responsibility when you do make a mistake. Uh, no ifs, ands, or buts. Hey, we made a mistake. Absolutely, we're going to fix it for you. Um, I would say one of my other last tips on um, uh, business management is never be too proud to steal a good idea from someone else. So <laughs> I'm joking a little bit, but what I'm serious about is that um, the the things you learn in different aspects of your life can all be applied to other aspects of your life. You know, something that you might be talking about with a friend or, you know, your grandmother can easily apply to business or to your career, to your company, to managing a good company. Um, good ideas come from unexpected sources. So I would uh, encourage you to keep that in mind, you know, as you're finishing your college career and, and thinking about your professional career. Um, everybody in, um, in society today wants to like break the human person down to, to all these little fragmented um, you know, entities. And um, the more you realize that you need to you know, embrace the whole of who you are as a person, not just one little portion of it, um, the more you realize that you can have, um, well, sorry, I got off my note there. Um, let me bump in here. So this, um, just getting on to uh, what Jackson was saying at the end there again about um, kind of struggles and triumphs is that um, I, uh, I'm, I'm married, I have four kids at home as well, and um, it's not easy balancing, you know, all the demands that life puts upon you, so your, your family and, you know, the spiritual life obviously being the most important, but then you've got your career, you know, your job, your company, when you work in a small business, you have a lot of people that are depending on you to do your job and to do it well. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of conflicting, um, a lot of conflicting commitments that you have in your life. And this is where I was starting to go with that, the, with the totality of your personhood and everything. I I'd saw commuting a couple of months ago on 66, a bumper sticker on a guy's car and it said, uh, I was cool before I became a dad. And I was just like, wow, that's, that's really depressing, dude. If that's what you think about, you know, what you were before you became a father and now how you think about yourself now that you are a father. Um, you know, he thinks that he can't be cool anymore because he's a dad. I mean, that idea is a lot of what is what I was starting to go with this is um, that idea is what's wrong with a lot of society that we're trying to break down, you know, into all these little groups like, oh, well, are you, are you a dad or are you cool? You know, are you, are you a student or are you, um, 
a son? Are you a father? Are you a Virginian? Are you a Republican? Are you a Catholic? You know, what, what are you? But we need to, we need to sort of re-embrace the totality of who we are as people and realize that having balance in your life. So yes, I'm a dad. I'm also a COO. I'm also a husband. I'm also, what do I do? I, I play in a band for fun. You know I mean? Like all those things are not, none of those things define me. I am all of those things together. And it's very important to have balance in your life, to have, you know, a hobby, some consistent form of recreation so that you're not, um, you know, just burning yourself out on your career. Um, working to restore all things in Christ. That's obviously, you know, the motto here at Crescentum, right? So how, how do we do that in our companies? How do we do that in our careers? A lot of people ask me, I mean, I've been working at the same company for, um, for eight years, you know, since before I graduated from Crescentum here. And so everybody's like, wow, it, you know, that must be a great company, and, and it is. But what is, it, what is it about that company that's so special? What is it that you, do, you know, what gets you up in the morning? What gets you to go to work? What gets you, um, you know, what energizes you to keep on doing that job? Um, and I mean, really what it, on a sort of obviously natural level, the company um, over the last eight years is five times as big as it was eight years ago. We, I was the fifth full-time employee. Now we've got 15 or 16 full-time employees. So there's, there's a natural level of pride there, right? Like we've, I've, I've been a big part of helping to grow, um, uh, grow the business. But I've also got a family. You know, I got married six months after I graduated, uh, seven months after I graduated. Um, we had our first son uh, before our first anniversary. We have four kids now. And what I'm doing in my career is allowing me to provide for them, um, you know, to form them as future citizens of heaven. In the meantime, as citizens of my family, as citizens of this town, of, of this country. And that's a really difficult but incredibly rewarding experience. Um, so, I mean, the very fact that I'm able to do that because of my career and because of what I do at Econize, you know, that's what gets you up in the morning. Um, I would really encourage all of you also to kind of forget this phrase, uh, dream job. You know, oh, if I had my dream job, life would be great. There's no such thing as a dream job. I can tell you, my dream job would be if you could put me on a gun range with a stack of firearms that high and I could just shoot guns all day long. Sure, that's my dream job. But I guarantee you, if, if you take your dream job and that's what this, like, the summation of your life is, like, the only thing that matters to you is if you were to get your dream job. So I'm, I'm kind of talking about from, like, maybe a secular perspective here. Not us, obviously, as, as Catholics, but, oh, if I just had my dream job, I'd be happy. I guarantee you that person moves into their dream job, and in six months, it's drudgery, you know? So the point is not what the job is, what that dream job is. The point is how you, as a person, are finding fulfillment in your life, and hopefully it's not just in your job. It's in what your job allows you to do because of your career, and, you know, and, and possibly providing for a family. Um, obviously, as well, then... Um, you know, like Jackson was saying, how can you, to restore all things in Christ, um, lift up your coworkers, you know, on a daily basis? So maybe a little bit easier for me, like I said, I don't know if any of you heard me not on the mic there, but my company is about 98% Catholic. Um, so that makes it a lot easier from the perspective of just knowing that you're on a lot of common ground with your coworkers and your fellow employees. Um, but again, but every day, how can you you know, help in, in situations within work, situations outside of work, and help them improve, not just in what they're doing and in their career and in their, in their business skills or their sales or whatever it might be, but how can you also try to help them become better people? Um, so in conclusion here, guys, uh, to return to my, my opening analogy, you know, the gin and tonic, um, like I said it's not complicated, but what I didn't say is that it doesn't take hard work. So anything in life is going to take hard work. Anytime you hear somebody telling you that you can get this great thing done and, oh, you'll be able to do this or that or the other without hard work, you know, just, that's, it's BS. That's what you're smelling. So they're full of it. Uh, anything worth doing in life is worth doing well, and it's, it's worth doing, it's worth working hard for. So, you know, the slogan here from uh, the um, admissions is dare to be great. I'd modify that a little bit tonight and tell you guys, don't just dare to be great, choose to be great, and then work really hard at it. You know, preparing for your careers, in your studies here, in your relationships with your friends, girlfriend, boyfriend, um, in your relationship with God and the spiritual life, you know, being healthy or fit, all of it takes work. So.
So if you accept that and you embrace that, then you're a good, you know, a good step on that path starting forward. So um, thank you all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, <laughs>